Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, you know, friends, one of the greatest gifts that we have, if not the greatest gift that we have, is the Holy Bible. We have been given God's word, God's plan for man, and all we have to do is read it, study it, meditate upon it, and it truly changes our lives. And for those of you who practice reading the Bible on a continual basis, day by day, you can give testimony to this. You know that it's true. And yet, it's like explaining the color blue to a blind man. We can't tell anyone else the importance of reading the Bible so that they will fully understand it until they read it for themselves. And so it is true with you, friends. If you want to understand what it is so many of us are trying to communicate to you and you're not reading the Bible on a regular basis in large portions, not just a few verses from a devotional book, but truly reading the Bible, sitting down and reading the entire book of Matthew in one sitting, the entire book of Revelation in one sitting, the entire book of Genesis in one sitting. If you're not reading and absorbing the word of God like this on a continual basis, you're never going to understand what it is that me and others like me are trying to teach you, trying to show you in the truth that is contained within God's word. But for those of us that do, what a gift it is. And that's why we sing hallelujah for the great things God has done for his people and is doing for his people in giving us the holy word of God so that we're not caught by surprise. I mean, think about it for a moment. We live in a world of turmoil, especially what's going on here in the United States right now. There's so much doubt. There's so much confusion. Those, there, there's so much fear. And yet here we are as the people of God, and for some supernatural reason, we're at peace because we have that calm assurance knowing that God is in control. And no matter what man does, no matter the mistakes that man makes, no matter the bad decisions that our po political leaders make and where they take this world into, the direction that they take it to, we have a calm assurance knowing that there's nothing in this life that can take what rests within our souls. And that's the assurance of knowing that we have been saved, that we are being saved, and that we will be saved. What I mean by that is we have been saved from ourselves and from the sin that resides and, and, and plagues us, resides within us, we have been saved when we met the Lord Jesus and we surrendered to his will. We're being saved on a daily basis as we sanctify ourselves, we separate ourselves from the darkness and the evil and the bad choices of this world. And then we're going to be saved when the Lord Jesus returns and he calls us home. And for that, we say hallelujah. Hallelujah, because they can chop our heads off. They can put us in prison. They can cause bad things to happen to us. And we may experience much pain and sorrow and suffering in this life. But in the end, hallelujah, we are saved. And for that, we give King Jesus all the praise and all the glory. Well, we're continuing our study in what the Bible says about. And today I want to talk about sin. Now, before we begin, we must understand that there is something called church lingo. And the bad thing about church lingo is that we hear it so often and so many times throughout our life that it, it loses its piercing value from like when the first time that we heard it, it pierced us, it cut us to the core. But now we've heard it so many times, we just say it so loosely, just like when we pass someone and we say, well, I'm blessed. 
where we say, I'm going to pray for you. But we need to better explain that because that person has heard that, that saying, that cliche, that church lingo so many times that it loses its piercing value. But if you were to stop and say to someone, you know, when I talk to the father, I'm going to mention you specifically to him. That cuts through all the church lingo, the cliche, what they are so used to hearing, and it rings true for them. And they will stop in their tracks, turn around and tell you, thank you. Thank you for doing that for me. Because it's lost its normality. It, it sits upon their ear and their heart as something they've never heard before. And so it is with this word sin. When we tell people that they sin, oh, I know, but I'm human. They don't understand the, the darkness that the word sin contains, and they don't understand the wrath that it causes within the Creator, within God the Father, within the Almighty against us, and they don't understand the fear that it should create within us when we come to the conclusion that we are sinners. And for that, God is angry with us. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalm that God is angry with the wicked every day. In Psalm chapter 5, let's look at that for a moment. Psalm chapter 5, this is what it says. Note, Psalm chapter 5, verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. The foolish shall not stand in the sight of the Lord. Why? Because the Lord hates all the workers of iniquity. Now you've heard your whole life, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. But that's not what the Bible says here. In, in Psalm 5.5, 5, God hates all workers of sin, all workers of lawlessness, all workers of iniquity. Just as another example, look at Psalm chapter 11, verse 5. The Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked and him that loves violence, his soul hates. How much more clear can you be? And the reason God hates it is because it's against everything that he is. God is holy. God is pure. Man is wicked. Man is sinful. And he's been born in this state, which separates him from God. Now, another thing that you've heard, another cliche, another saying that's been passed down through tradition is that we are all the children of God. But friends, that's not true. If you'll recall and you're familiar with the Gospels, the story of Jesus, Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you are of your father, the devil. So we are all children of the devil until we are born again. But before I get ahead of myself, let's talk about this word sin. And in order to understand the word sin, we must go all the way back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, and let's begin in verse 26. Now God says, let us, and notice in that us, there is a plurality there, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Now, this is where people want to say, well, we're born and, and we're created in the image of God. Adam was created in the image of God. We, friends, are created in the image of Adam. You don't believe me? Well, turn to chapter 3. I'm sorry, chapter 5. And let's look together. It says, verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, he created him. Now, in the day that God created man, who did he create? Adam. And in the likeness of God, made he him, or made he Adam. Male and female created he them, Adam and Eve, and he blessed them. And he called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness, not in God's likeness, in Adam's likeness, after his image and called his name Seth. 
And so everyone that came from the lineage of Adam is created in the image of Adam. That's why in the New Testament, we are told there is a first Adam and there is a second Adam. The first Adam is this man God created who undid the work of God. And the second Adam is the man God created, Jesus of Nazareth, who completed the work of God, who did what Adam was unable to do. And so it's important that we understand that we are created in sin. We're born in sin. And we only become the children of God after the new birth. That's why Jesus said in order to enter into the kingdom, one must be born again. We have to be recreated in the likeness of God. And that comes at the new birth. That's why the Bible tells us once we become the the new creation in Christ, God gives us, the Almighty gives us his spirit, his character, his nature, and we begin to look more like him than the person that we used to be. We take on the attributes of God. We take on gentleness, kindness, love for others, self-despising of ourselves, rejection of ourselves, attributes of discipline, where we begin to discipline ourselves to go against the natural way and to begin to pursue the supernatural way. We begin to pursue God and flee sin. Well, again, now let's, let's continue on this idea of what is sin, because what we see here is that Adam was created in the image of God, but everyone who followed after Adam was created in the image of Adam with the attributes and the character and the nature of Adam. So what was it that Adam did that was the downfall of all mankind? Well, for that, let's turn to Genesis chapter three and let's begin at verse one. Now it says the serpent was more subtle or crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And so the serpent said unto the woman, has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, two things happen here. One, the very first thing that the enemy does, the, the serpent, Satan through the serpent does to cause conflict within the woman is he creates doubt as to what God has said. You know, that's what people still do today. Even with the Bible itself, when you sit down and you talk to people about the Bible, so often they will argue that the Bible has been changed over time. But for those of us who read it on a continual basis, we know that there's no way man could have changed it. It's too intertwined and it works so perfectly well within itself that there's no way man could have changed it because if man had gotten his hands on it, we would have lost so many things that man would have changed for their own comfort. For instance, King David, the greatest man in the history of Israel. If man could have, he would have taken out the sin of David because he would have wanted to make David look so pure and righteous. And so he would have taken out the sin against Bathsheba. And that's just one small example. There are so many, hundreds of things. The more we read the Bible, the more we see the spiritual quality, the spiritual value and and God's foresight in keeping the Bible pure and holy and, and untouched by man over the, the centuries, over the millennia. So Satan creates doubt here as to what God has said. And what does woman do? Immediately she says, well, God has told us not to eat of the tree, but then she adds to God's word and she says, neither shall you touch it. The Bible doesn't say that she was told not to touch it. She was only told not to eat of it. Now, maybe in safeguarding herself, she created the rule not to touch it so that she didn't even get close to it, thereby to be tempted. But you know, there's two times, once in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament, where we're told not to take away from the word of God and not to add to the word of God. And so it's important we stand upon the word of God and we don't take away or we don't add to it. Well, now you know the story. Obviously, the woman partakes of the fruit and it's not an apple, 
That, that's tradition. The Bible doesn't say an apple. It says a fruit. The, the woman took from the fruit in verse 6. She saw that it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. And it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now, in the book of James, James discusses the matter of sin. And he says in verse 14, every man is tempted into sin when he is drawn away by his own lust and he is enticed. Then once that lust has conceived or been born within him, takes root within him, it will bring forth sin. And sin, of course, when it is finished, will bring forth death. Now in the book of 1 John, we are told in, in chapter 2, verse 15, love not the world, and do not love the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, now notice this, the lust of the flesh, the woman desired the fruit, the lust of the eyes. She desired the fruit because it would add something to her life that was missing, or so she thought and the pride of life. It would give her the knowledge of God that she didn't have at that moment of time. And so she partakes of the fruit, back to Genesis chapter uh, 3 and verse 6, and then she gave unto her husband, and he did eat. Now this would be the first sin. But what do we mean when we say this was the first sin? It's simply the first act of disobedience. But let's break that down a little bit more. Why was it an act of disobedience? For one reason alone, because they did what they wanted to do instead of what God wanted them to do. And that's what sin is in its most basic form, friends, doing what we want to do instead of what God wants us to do. Now, we know that if we want to learn what it is God wants us to do, we're going to find that in the Holy Scriptures. Genesis through Revelation tells us very clearly what he wants us to do, how he wants us to behave, how he wants us to act, how he wants us to think, what he wants us to practice. All the details of this life in a daily form are given to us in the word of God. And anything that goes against that teaching is an act of disobedience. It's an act of self-will and therefore it's sin. So in its simplicity, sin is simply doing what we want to do instead of what God wants us to do. Now sin, if you were to sit down on a piece of paper and write down all the different forms of sin, you could fill up a notebook. I mean, we know sin being murder. We know sin being rape. We know sin being pedophilia. We know sin being theft. But those are all the large things. What about the small things, the little sins, if we would call them that? The things that we think, the things that we imagine, the, the feelings, the attitudes that we have at times. Let me give you an example. And sometimes it can catch us off guard and we will not even realize this happened until too late. But let me give you an example. I was in a McDonald's the other day. And while I was in that McDonald's, uh, the day before I had been there, and I have a gentleman that I care for who's autistic. He can't care for himself, so I do everything for him. And so we went to McDonald's and while at McDonald's the, the previous day, I wanted to get him a cup of water in a courtesy cup. And the guy that was at the counter told me, just go ahead and get him, you know, a Coke and don't worry about it. It's on the house. And so I said, okay, we got our meal. We went, we said our blessing, we ate our food and we left. Well, the next day we went back to McDonald's and th there was a girl at the counter. She gave me the courtesy cup. I walked over, I started to get water because that's what I told her I was going to get. But then I was reminded, a, a thought popped in my head of the previous day. Just go ahead and get him a Coke. So I went ahead and filled up the Coke. I went and I sat down. We were eating. I ran out of Coke. I walked up to get a refill on my Coke. And she said, you owe me a dollar. Well, immediately it caught me off guard. But I knew in, in the back of my mind, I knew I was wrong. When I, when I didn't get water and I got Coke, I knew I should have gotten water or I should have walked up to her and told her about the event yesterday and allowed her to say, well, yeah, you can go ahead and get a Coke or no, you need to get water or pay for the Coke. 
So I knew I was wrong the moment that I got it. But she brought it to the forefront and pride reared its ugly head and I immediately became defensive. Because what she was implying was that I was a thief, that I had stolen the Coke, taken the Coke, it did not belong to me, I did not pay for it, therefore I was stealing the Coke. And because she called my guilt to the surface and my act to the surface, I became defensive and began to make excuses drawing back on the previous day, which there may be a little bit of legitimacy in that argument. But the fact of the matter is she was right, I was wrong. I was stealing the Coke. But I became defensive and began to lash back at her, began to fight back with it. What, you're calling me a thief? And I'm ashamed of the way that I acted. I'm ashamed that I way, the way that I acted in front of her, and I'm ashamed of the way I acted because God was watching. He was present because I, I was caught off guard. I didn't have a moment to take a breath, and I should have. But I didn't have a moment to take a breath and say, you know, you're right. I, I apologize for that. I could have made excuse at that time, but even that I shouldn't have done. I should have said, you're right, I'm wrong, here's my dollar, um, and I apologize. And, and I should have left it at that. But I didn't, I became defensive, and I sinned in, in the presence of that woman, in the presence of everyone else in that McDonald's who was privy to what was going on, and in the presence of God, who I, I will give account for one day for that action. All I can do from it now is I can learn from it and I can pray that God will the next time give me the, the wisdom and the, and the insight not to put myself in a situation like that. But if I do, that I will act according to the nature of God and not the nature of Adam, which is exactly what I did. I began to blame others. I blamed her. I blamed the guy the day before. I blamed everyone but myself. But I'm the one that sinned. And for that, I was wrong. And, and we all do that on a daily basis in our attitudes and, and in the, the way that we interact with other people and the things that we think about nobody else knows about, the things that we may watch, the things that we may say in private, uh, gossip, and, and there's just so many. We could fill up a notebook writing down all the different forms of sin that offer itself and present itself to us in a lifetime. But the simple definition is simply doing what we want to do instead of doing what God wants us to do. And that's what we see here. And that's, what is, that's why it's so important to stand upon what Jesus said. The only way we're ever going to see the Father is if we've been born again. And when we understand what it means to be born again, and we've talked about it so many times in previous videos, in the book of Ezekiel, we're told that God's going to take out a heart of stone, that selfish, rebellious, defiant will within us, and he's going to give us a new heart, a new will, a new desire to begin to deny what we want to do and to obey what it is that God wants us to do. And so when we do what God wants us to do, we're not sinning, we're doing according to righteousness. And when we don't do what God wants us to do, we're sinning. And that's why people will define to you that there's really not a big sin and a little sin. Sin is sin. And that's what they're trying to say. They're, they're simply saying that sin is an act of disobedience to God and therefore brings the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the chastisement of God upon us. And it begins with a simple conviction from his spirit to, to inform us that we have disobeyed him. And once we recognize that, we bow our heads in shame and guilt and sorrow, and we plead with God to forgive us. And not just to forgive us, but to give us the strength not to do it again. And so we're striving for perfection. We're striving for holiness. We're striving to be as much like God and Jesus as we can and we're denying ourselves all the things that we know brings God displeasure. And so let's close by looking at what took place in the garden on that day. It says in verse 8, again, chapter 3 of Genesis, it says in verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden as he was so accustomed to do. He came and he visited with them in the cool of the day. 
And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Why? Because they were ashamed. They knew that they had disobeyed God. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto Adam, where are you? Isn't that what he does to us? Where are you? Your sin has distanced you from me. All you must do is confess your sin and I will come running to you. Look at what he told Cain in chapter four, verse six. Cain was wrestling with the idea of killing his brother over the envy that rested in his heart. And the Lord said unto Cain in verse six, why are you wroth? Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? Will I not come running to you? But if you do not well, sin lies at your door and it will separate you from me, Cain. It will distance you from me. And that's what takes place here. And that's what takes place with us. One simple little sin, one act of gossip, one little bitty lie, uh, one, one acting out of character like I did can separate us from God and that sin can distance us from him. And so he calls to us, where are you? I want to meet with you. I want to fellowship with you, but I can't because there's something that's blocking that fellowship. And notice what the man immediately says in verse 12, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat the fruit of the tree and I did eat. So Adam immediately begins the blame game. He doesn't take accountability for his own actions. He blames the woman. And in verse 13, the woman, she does the same. The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Everybody was blaming everybody else. And that's what we do. We blame everyone else. We take the victim status. But we need to stand before God, bow our heads in the shame and guilt that rests upon us and ask for his forgiveness. And if we do that, friends, 1 John, back to 1 John for a moment. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 tells us if we confess our sins, if we confess our disobedience, if we confess that we've been doing what we want to do instead of what God wants us to do, God will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people who have been called by my name will humble themselves in order to admit our guilt, we must humble ourselves. So that's step one. Then we must pray. If we humble ourselves and we pray, we talk to God the Father and we seek his face and we turn from our wicked ways. We make a resolve within ourselves not to do those same things again. We strive for the perfection that God has set before us. Then the Bible says God will hear from heaven, will forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. So friends, as we've described and as we've discovered together what sin is in its most basic, simplest form, I want to leave you with hope because you may be watching this video today and you may have been doing what you want to do for oh so long. It may be smoking pot. It may be drinking alcohol. It may be sleeping around with women. It may be lying to get a promotion at work or, or so many other things from a grand level of sin or a simple level of sin. It could be a, a, an act of unforgiveness and bitterness that you've been holding on to and you're unwilling to release. I want to give you hope that if you will take that before God the Father, he will give you peace where you have been at unrest. And he will give you the calm assurance that all God's people know, no matter what happens in this life, I know that Jesus has forgiven my sin. He's washed them away and I will stand one day before him and he will look at me and accept me into his kingdom. And there I will live for him eternally. Friends, I want you to know that assurance. And all you have to do is simply humble yourself. Humble yourself before the almighty God. You are weak. You are a worm of the earth. He is the almighty and you must look to him for the answer. You must speak to him and pray to him, talk to him, confess to him and ask of him. You must seek his face diligently 
and you must turn from your wicked ways. And if you do that with true godly sorrow and repentance, he has promised to forgive you and to set you free where you can live this life abundantly, not in the things that this life has to offer, but abundantly in your spirit. You can smile when others are worrisome. You can praise when others are fearful. And you can sing with the joy of the Lord when others have lost all hope. Why? Because Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. What he has told us in his word is true and he is coming for his people. He is coming to set up his kingdom on this earth and we will reside and serve him for eternity's end. And that should bring joy and hope to your life in a way that nothing else can. Well, friends, we're going to close there today. And as we close, I just want to remind you, go to, go to our website, our YouTube ministry, and click on the playlist. We've broken everything into playlists for you to simplify it, make it as easy as possible. And I know that many of you that are new to this website have not done that as of yet, but there is much teaching there that will bless your soul because it's the word of God explained and expounded upon. We have book studies like the entire book of Romans where we go verse by verse through the book of Romans, verse by verse through the book of Hebrews, verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. We have the red letter series that it focuses on specifically the teachings of Jesus the red letters that are contained within your Bible. And we discuss so that we can better understand what it is that Jesus expects from us as his followers. And so I want to encourage you to go to the playlist on our YouTube site and, and look at what we have to say. Look at what we have to offer you that will bless you in your journey with Jesus on a daily basis. Well, as I said, we're going to close there today, friends. I truly love you. I'm so grateful that you took some time out of your day to spend some time learning about the Word of God. And I always invite your comments. So if there's anything that you want to post, any question that you may have that I can help you in your journey, don't be afraid. Post your question. If it's a simple prayer that you've offered for us, let us know about it. I'm quick to respond always to everyone who leaves a reply, whether I agree with it or not. So with that being said, friends, I truly love you. I pray for you daily. And it is my hope that until we meet again, your journey with Jesus will be blessed and full of joy. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I truly do love you. I'll see you on the next video.